Um, this is uh, going to be joint work with Catherine Wolfram, who has been at MIT and is going to be a uh, postdoc at Yale. Uh, and it's based on earlier work that I did with uh, uh, Cosmin Pohat, that was now at Emory. Um, and, uh, well, the, here's the sort of what I'm going to talk about. There's sort of four things I'd like to talk about. Maybe I won't get to the all the way, but the, after the definitions, there's a, sort of a nice combinatorial part, and then a little bit of asymptotics, and then uh, one of the interesting things about this model is, uh, is uh, it's a model that you can define and study on general graphs, not just planar graphs. You know, often in StatMech, uh, we are, for, for various reasons, even deep reasons, we're constrained to two dimensions, but we, even though we can define things in three dimensions, it's very hard to, to study them. People don't have good combinatorial techniques. But this model actually is made to, to work on a general graph, and it gives some interesting, I think it's one of the first models where we actually have some non-trivial sort of shapes uh, uh, in, in high dimensions beyond the two-dimensional case. So that's, that's sort of the, the appeal of this model, and uh, the multinomial sort of prefix uh, works in, in, for other models as well. It's not just the Dimer model. You can do other random tiling models. And uh, I think there's a lot to explore here. But I want to just tell you sort of the, 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 the sort of the easiest case, easiest interesting case, which is this multinomial Dimer model. And uh, so here's the basic definition. I'm going to start with G, just a graph, a finite graph for the most part. Eventually, I want it to be infinite, but let's just start with a finite graph. And I'm and I'm going to make a new graph, so let's fix some integer, positive integer n, and I'm going to make a new graph g sub n, which is like the blow-up graph. And it's very simple. You just uh, uh, replace each vertex with n vertices. So each vertex of the original graph gets, gets replaced with n vertices. I think of those as sort of floating over the, the original graph. And then each edge just becomes a complete bipartite uh, graph upstairs. So every edge Every edge is possible between the, if there's an edge between two vertices downstairs, then for every lift, every pair of lifts, there's, a, there's an edge. Okay, so that's called the blow up. And, you know, you don't, you don't have to have the uh, same multiplicity at every vertex. You can have varying multiplicities if you like, and that's actually useful uh, <coughs> for enumerating purposes, as you'll see in a second, uh, to allow the ends to vary. So for each vertex, uh, we can have our own Multiplicity. So you like, you know, you think about taking your graph, each vertex, you break it apart with a hammer into a into a some finite number of vertices. And uh, for this talk, we're going to be interested in the number of dimer covers of this blow-up graph. And let's call that z sub n. Boldface n means I'm letting potentially I'm letting the n's vary from vertex to vertex. Uh, and what's a dimer cover? It's just a perfect matching of the graph, right? Everybody know what a dimer cover is? Yeah. Uh, so, and so, just just to get us off the ground, here's a very simple example. Uh, I just took a square as my base my base graph, and now I'm not going to draw the blow up. I'm just going to think of that each vertex gets blown up, blown up with uh, n copies, and you can think of them as sort of coming out of the board if you like. And uh, then, uh, what does a typical dimer cover look like a along this edge of the downstairs graph? There's going to be on the on the <laughs> On the upper graph, there's going to be some k edges going this way, and, and then there has to be n minus k edges this way. Because there's n vertices here, if k of them go that way, then n minus k have to go that way, which forces k here and n minus k there. Right, so a, so a, a general dimer cover of the blow-up graph here has this, when you project it back to the original graph, has some multiplicity k, n minus k in that pattern. And so let's just do the count in this, in this easy case, because I think it's a... It's a illustrative of what goes on in general. Uh, if I've got the multiplicities n at each vertex, how do we count dimer covers? Well, uh, in, at this vertex, we've got, uh, right, this vertex represents n vertices above it. You have to choose a subset of k of those vertices to be matched this way and n minus k to be matched that way. Right, and, that, and, and, and because the because of the symmetry, any, any such subset uh, is equivalent to any other subset. So there's a binomial coefficient, n choose k, which represents the number of vertices which are sort of being matched that way. In a perfect matching, every, every vertex is matched to every other vertex. So all the n vertices here 
k of them go this way, k of them are matched this way, n minus k are matched that way. That's a binomial coefficient. And there's four vertices, so we got the binomial coefficient to the fourth power. But then, uh, you know, once we've chosen which, which set of k vertices here and here are matched, we also have to choose the isomorphism between them. It's a, it's a complete bipartite graph, and there are k factorial ways to, to pair up those vertices. So that gives us these two, uh, you know, for each edge now, we've got a, a factorial, an appropriate factorial power. So that's the, that's the expression for the partition function that number of dimer covers, and it simplifies to that. And let's see, uh, you know, you can kind of see that the central term is the largest, and, that, and the, by analyzing that, you find that the the growth rate of this thing is, if you let capital K be the number of dimers, the number of uh, number of dimers in, in any given dimer cover, in this case as K is two times N, then the, then the partition function here is just K factorial times some exponential growth rate, E to the C times K plus lower order terms. And this is true, uh, not just for this graph, but in general, as you'll see, uh, there's always this k factorial, where k is the number of dimers, and then there's this exponential growth rate, and this, the quantity c is the interesting thing, uh, that is the thing we care about. Any questions? What is c equal to in this example? Uh, it's zero in this example. <laughs> 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 but it's not zero in general, okay, so there's, uh, that's, but okay, never mind. Here's, here's the combinatorial, here's this very simple combinatorial theorem, uh, which allows us to, you know, sort of get off the ground. Uh, uh, which is that the, when you make a, if you think about all possible choices of multiplicities at all possible vertices, you can, you can, right, you, you take these z of boldface n and you make a multivariable generating function, exponential generating function out of them, then this, where you, where you allow all possible positive multiplicities at all vertices. And then this has this multivariable generating function has this very simple form, formula. It's just e to the p, where p is a p is a, c is a certain polynomial called the edge polynomial. What is that? Uh, you just pick a variable for every vertex. X of v is a variable for each vertex, and you and for every edge, you take the product of the two endpoint variables, and you just sum over all the edges of the graph. That's the so-called edge polynomial. Okay, so that's a that's a, a very simple polynomial associated to a graph. Uh, it's easy to compute, uh, and then the the uh, well the the way the way things are set up, it's a reasonably easy to prove this theorem. I mean, it's, it's just a few lines, or if you know some generating function, you can argue this in just a line, one line. Okay, that, but that's great because now our our partition function, which is what we really care about, counting these things, is really just a, a coefficient extraction from this very simple polynomial, with a very simple uh, function. Uh, and then the asymptotics are, are kind of straightforward at that point, right, because everything is positive, you get a positive formal power series. Uh, and let me just go through the answer, it, you know, none of this is hard, so I'm not going to focus on this part, but uh, let me just tell you the answer. Uh, let's let capital K be the number of dimers, which is one half the sum of the multiplicities. And then we, the, the, the goal is to write everything in terms of, right? So then the, the answer is that the, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> K is the number of dimers. And now we're gonna, we're interested in the case when the multiplicities get large, go to infinity in such a way that the ratio uh, of the, individual vertex multiplicities with k tends to some constant. So, so they just all tend to infinity uh, so that their ratios are, are, are tending to constants. That constants are called alpha v, those are the sort of fraction of the tiles or the dimers covering a vertex v. Right, and then, then as, you, as in the example, this, this, coefficient, this uh, partition function has this particular form, k factorial times e to the sum constant c, uh, okay, that, that's that exponential growth rate that we care about, and c has this nice form, log of p minus summation over the vertices, alpha log alpha x, where now the, the x's 
our, our numerical value, satisfy a certain equation, right? So if you, if, you, if you are interested in a particular boldface n, you have to find some numerical positive numerical values for these x variables. Right? Initially, the x's are just variables, but now we're going to assign some positive real value. Uh, and if they satisfy this, this particular crit critical equation, criticality equation, then, then you will get the correct growth rate here. What's going on is just some sort of Legendre duality here, if you know what that means. Uh, it's kind of a s s s reasonably straightforward coefficient extraction from that previous uh, calculation. But the, but the net result is that this is the interesting uh, equation. If I'm trying to find the partition function as a function of the n's, and, and for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to focus on the case where all the n's are constant. So just have a single n, which works for all the vertices. So all the multiplicities are the same. Uh, then you have to solve this equation here. And here you see uh, the derivative of p with respect to one of the variables divided by p equals alpha, alpha v, the, the desired uh, fraction. Okay, so, th so these x, xv's are called the, you know, critical gauge. Uh, what, the, what does it have to do with the gauge? Um, it's, it's a function, the xv's are, is a, the x defines a function on the vertices, uh, and the, uh, uh, well, the, it changed, it, well, okay, let's, let's see, how do I say that? Because uh, I didn't prepare a slide on what, what, what do I mean by this gauge, uh, but the, the people who work on dimers understand that uh, the, 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 the usual dimer model on a graph has this certain gauge invariance. If you multiply all the edge weights at a vertex by a constant, it doesn't change the underlying probability measure. And same thing is going on here. This is just a these x variables, you should think of them as just multiplying the edge, edge weights of the dimer model at, at a vertex locally. What is pxv? Can you explain what that means? Well, this is just the partial derivative of p with respect to the xv variable. But at, at what point, like, you know, partial, you, you treat it as a function, but then you relate it at some particular point? Right. You, right. Th so this is supposed to be an equation for the x's. You have to find the xv's such that the partial derivative of p with respect to xv at xv okay. uh, at the x variables equals this. So it's not a linear equation, it's actually it's a non-linear equation. Non equation, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's a, it's a uh, well, yeah, p, p is a quadratic, so if I put the p over here, then it's just a quadratic equation. Yeah, in fact, I think... And p is just the, the quadratic form associated with the graph of Boston. Exactly. P is the quadratic form, yeah, and here, here, here's the equation. I just put the P on the other side. It looks like this, you know. Uh, for every vertex V, the sum over all the neighbors of XU times XV, that is, the, the, if, you, if you think of XU times XV as the new weight, the weight when you change the gauge to the X gauge, the, the new weight is XU times XV, the sum of the weights around a vertex is supposed to be this, this number here, alpha V times P. Does it always have positive solution? Does it always have what? Does it always have positive solution? This equation? Yes. Yes. In fact, it has a unique positive solution. That's the theorem. Yeah. The XV, are the, the, there's some convexity going on. It's a Legendre duality. So it's really the unique, there's a unique positive solution to this equation, uh, as long as the original graph actually has the dimer cover. Right? So there's a little bit of non-degeneracy that you need for the graph, but uh, then it has a unique positive solution. Here's the, here's the equation again. It's a homogeneous equation, so the x's are only defined at the scale. Uh, and uh, like I said, in the rest of the talk, it, it, we're going to take all the n's to be equal to some positive, large number n. And so we can scale so that the right-hand side, right side is just a constant, then we might as well scale it so it's equal to 1. And this means that the, uh, the critical gauge is the is the one where the sum of the edge weights around each vertex is one. So, let, uh, uh, and then we can interpret the, the edge weights, the xu times xv, as the edge fractions, or the, the you know, we're, we're, we're doing a dimer cover of this, this blow-up graph, but if you project back to the original graph, you can ask how many dimers go this way and how many dimers go that way. Uh, 
the fraction which go this way and the fraction which go that way are proportional to the xu times xv. I mean, they're equal to the xu times xv. Okay, so let's just go through the example here. Suppose this, this was my base graph. We did the case of the square. This is kind of the next, maybe the next simple graph, bipartite graph. Uh, doesn't have to be bipartite, but uh, uh, I'm, used, I'm used to the bipartite graphs. Um, <clears throat> here's, the, uh, here's the adjacency matrix of that graph. If you think about the, the, the adjacency matrix between the white vertices and the black vertices, right? This, this, this black vertex has, has two neighbors, and this, this one has three neighbors, and so on. And so the, the, the goal with this equation is to find a, a function on the vertices that is uh, uh, such that when you multiply on the left and the right by that function, you, you change the gauge. This is a gauge transformation of this matrix. The new matrix is bistochastic. The sum of the rows is one and the sum of the columns is one. So, so you can see that it's kind of nonlinear, but in a, in a, in a very simple way. The, you take the adjacency matrix of the graph, you want to multiply it on the right and the left by diagonal matrices so that the resulting matrices, matrix is bistochastic. Bistochastic just means that the row and columns are sum, summing to one. And here, I, I give the solution in this case, and you can see that uh, there's some quadratic, I mean, involves square root of five. So there's at least two, two solutions, by, but uh, there's only one positive solution. And if I didn't make a mistake, <laughs> you, the, you know, uh, right, the new edge weights, the original edge weights are one, the new edge weights are given by this, you know, three minus root five over two and so on, and they do indeed sum to one at each vertex. The, the, by symmetry, this, this edge weight and this, that, that edge weight are the same, and this one and that one are the same. Okay, does that make, make sense? Rick, so the two groups of vertices are like black and white, right? So it's, it's really for bipartite it works like that, right? So. That's right. That's right. I mean, you could do the non-bipartite version that works the same way. There's really no difference. But what would be the two groups of, you know, you multiply with something on the left, something on the right, if it's not bipartite. Same, what same thing. On, you multiply by the same diagonal matrix on the right and left. If, if, you, you do the, if I did the full adjacency matrix here, it would, would be six by six. It's just a little bit too big to fit on the screen. But then it would be x1 through x6 here and x1 through x6 there. Now, the bipartite distance is not playing a role up to this point. Okay, so that's the uh, asymptotics uh, on any finite graph. Uh, well, uh, you have to kind of believe me that there's a unique, that there's some convexity involved, and that's why there's a unique positive solution. And because it's convex, it's very easy for your computer to find the solution. It's not so easy to, you know, find it algebraically. Right here, I had to actually solve some quadratic equation, and it's got some you know, square roots in it. If, if, I, if I did a slightly larger graph, it would be some solution to some nasty high degree polynomial algebraic equation. On the other hand, if, you, if you're lucky, you can find a graph where the solution is uh, nice. And uh, we look for a long time and, and uh, you know, for those of you who are familiar with the Dimer model, there's, there's a beautiful setting of the, the single Dimer model. Uh, called the astic diamond, where nice things happen. And for the single dimer covers of the astic diamond, the number of dimer covers is just a power of two. It's kind of an amazing fact. Well, it turns out that that graph also has some nice, is nice for our model, our model, this generalized, well, it's not really a generalized, different dimer model, because the critical gauge does have this nice rational form. It's a rational solution, even though it's a solution of some complicated algebraic equation, the, the, the positive solution is just rational. And there it is. You, you can kind of see the pattern if you stare at that for a little bit. That's for the, you know, order four Aztec diamond, but there's a similar solution for the order n Aztec diamond. You know, but if you, if you try to change the graph, like do an n by n square, the solution is just a total mess. You can only sort of find it numerically. So that's a little bit of a mystery why this one works and other ones don't. Uh, but let's, let's just pursue this, this particular case because, uh, as probably many of you know, the Aztec diamond is, is, has a lot of interesting features. In particular, there's a limit shape and so on. Uh, if, I, if I take the, the uh, now if I take a larger and larger Aztec diamond, oh, by the way, uh, you don't see any n in this model. This is sort of in the limit as, 
n has gone to infinity. Right? These fractions are, are what you get in the limit as n goes to infinity. Uh, so if you want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this graph grow, but the, the, the n parameter is going to grow much faster. Don't you also have to fix the alphas? Yeah, here all the alphas are being are constant. Ah. Yes, Sanjay. Is there a recursive way to compute these numbers as you grow the Aztec diamond? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. These numbers are just ratios of binomial coefficients. You'll, you'll uh, these ones here. Yeah, it's not hard to compute those numbers. But uh, once we have the correct gauge, uh, then there's a, an associated height function. Uh, for this for this model, it is a. If you like, you can think of it as a sort of a fractional dimer cover, right? Where each vertex, the yeah, at each vertex, the sum of the edge weights is one. So you know you can make a you, there, there's a way to make a height function by comparing two of these things. Uh, let me not spend too much time on on how you define the height function, but there is a sort of a two dimensional height function associated to this, just like in the usual Aztec diamond. And in the scaling limit, it has this very surprisingly simple shape uh, uh, expression, just x squared minus y squared, on that uh, diamond. Sir, but before the limit, the height function is random, right? Yeah, before the limit, the height, height function is random. In the limit, the, the, there's some concentration of the measure. And uh, the, this is the, uh, the expectation of the height function. If you want to know for a large but finite n what the fluctuations are, well, that's the last slide. So just hang on. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll get there. Uh, do I need to explain something more here? Ask, go ahead, ask questions. Yes. So are you taking the uh, random multinomial dimer cover? Is that, is that dimer yeah, so cover? what's happening is uh, I'm taking a, a large Aztec diamond. I'm taking n, the multiplicity, very large, much larger. And then I'm taking a random dimer cover of that thing. And then, then what's the fraction of the number of dimers which go this way versus that way? It's very close to four fifths, one fifths. And in the limit, as n goes to infinity, it tends to four fifths and one fifths. Now, when I take the well, that's for this this particular graph. Now, when I take this graph very large and take the scaling limit, uh, you know, the, the lattice spacing is now going to zero. The the height function associated to this guy to this particular dimer cover tends to do this. To this shape, x squared minus y squared. Why is the height function harmonic? Why is the height function? Yeah. Well, that's just an accident. Apparently, that's just an accident. I mean, if you change the change the region or the height function along the boundary, it will not be harmonic. In fact, there's a uh, an equation. Uh, you can there's a, a associated variational principle going on here, uh, which is sort of a, a little more complicated to, to explain. But let's Let's, let, me, let me try. So suppose we are interested in the multinomial dimer model on the scaling limit, just like in the previous picture of Z2, of a, some region in Z2. Maybe I can draw a picture here. So I take some, some region in the Z2 lattice, which I draw in a diagonal orientation, right? So I approximate it with, with some, uh, some big polyomino, and the lattice spacing here is epsilon. Right, so this is my region R, subset of R2. Did I call it R? Yeah. And uh, you know, along the boundary, I've got some, the, the sort of height function is, is determined just like in the standard dimer model. Then the limiting height function, which for, for this region, uh, does satisfy a certain variational principle. It's, it's, the, it's the function which maximizes a certain uh, quote unquote entropy function, which is the Integral of some local entropy, which I should, probably should have called this minus sigma, but because sigma is usually the negative of the entropy. But never mind, uh, <laughs> the sign is not not the essential thing here. So, so you you can find the maximizer by uh, you can find the the, the the height function by maximizing this entropy function. And there's an explicit explicit expression for the the entropy function sigma, which just depends on the derivatives of the height function h, the, the partial derivatives s and t are the, here s is a, s is dh dx, and t is dh1, dh dy. Right, 
right? So, so the, the, the content of the theorem is that there is a way to find the, that limiting height function as a, through this variational principle with this particular energy. In this case, it's the energy is just the entropy, negative the entropy. Uh, and uh, if you look for the PDE, which uh, maximizes or satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equation, then it, the PDE has a very simple but nonlinear form here. Here h is the height function, the function whose graph we're looking for, the function whose graph defines the height function, and the hxx over 1 minus hx squared. Here these are the partial derivatives, second partial derivatives with respect to x, second partial derivatives with respect to y, divided by 1 minus hy squared equals 0. And uh, it just so happens that, you know, x squared minus y squared satisfies this equation. You can check if I didn't make a mistake. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh. What? Yes? Okay. <laughs> it's still that you want to take the, the number of vertices to infinity before the size of the, the region for this two? That's right. That's right. We need to take the, the n parameter, the blow up parameter, to infinity faster than the, than the other parameter. So, so Right, that's a, it's a little bit, you have to be a little bit careful about the order of the limits. Is it possible to imagine like a difference when you scale things at the same time or something like that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> we don't know though. I mean, our, at the moment, we, we, we have to do it this way. I think that it doesn't matter, but uh, you know, we haven't proved so that, that, that kind of thing. As the graph gets large, you, you kind of, uh, it's harder to keep track of the asymptotics unless you do it one way. You expect the same result? But I expect the same result, right. right. So uh, it's, it's, it's something of an accident that for the Aztec diamond, you get a nice harmonic solution. Generally, the solutions are given in terms of some hypergeometric functions. Uh, and I, I'm, a, I'm afraid I don't have other, other pictures to show you except I, I can, of course, it's easy to simulate, but uh, it's hard to give exact solutions because of this. It's hard to work with the hypergeometric things. Uh, Could it be that the solution is so complicated because you insist on constant alphas, and if you tweak them to some other uh, yeah, function, then you will get nice algebraic? Right. We did a tiny bit of exploration in that direction, but we're not, didn't arrive at any other simple things. There are some sort of easy things to do. Like if you want to do the square, then, then you can adjust the boundary values so that the co constant function is the solution. But you have to adjust the boundary multiplicities just a little bit. Okay. So yes. It's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. If you take something like periodic boundary conditions, you would expect alphas to be from. Yeah, if, if you ch take like a, if, if you have a nice homogeneous graph, then all the x's are constant. It's very easy to give the but then, this, then there's no shape. It's just a, it's going to be a flat, flat, boring shape. So, uh, uh, so for the dimers, for the usual dimers, you have the same sort of result, but with different energies. Exactly. Kind of yeah, yeah. This, this was supposed to be analog of the result of cohen kenyon prop back from the early 2000s about the actual dimer model, where you have a very similar statement with a different surface tension. The surface tension involves some die logarithms in that case. Uh, uh, and then the Euler, and th therefore the Euler-Lagrange equation looks different too. And, and, and so, do you ever see like an Arctic Circle, some kind of flat area? Yeah, for this, for this, uh, right? That's that's a good question. Uh, for this model, uh, all our solutions are always analytic, all the way up to the boundary. So we don't expect uh, Arctic circles or Arctic phenomena or facets. Because sigma itself doesn't have single. Right, because sigma itself is, uh, is in this case, strictly concave and analytic. Uh, Rick, what do you know if you don't send multiplicity to infinity, if you keep them equal to five? Do you know what are the ratio no. principles? No. No. I mean, that, that's a, probably a very hard problem. I mean, even, you know, n equals one we can do if it's a planar graph. n equals five, nobody really knows how to solve that one. But there is some, in principle, some surface tension which somehow would interpolate between these two. That would be kind of cool to find, a, find that surface tension. Well, oh, yeah, so then we, the, the, another very simple graph is the honeycomb graph, 
nice things, that's also, for the single dimer model, that's also a very simple graph for the, for which we know a lot about it. Uh, here, we were able to also find a one family of graphs uh, for which the critical gauge was, was nice and rational. Again, uh, ratios of, of finite wave coefficients. It's not clear why th this one also worked, but this is, a, this is not a finite graph, it's an infinite graph. You take sort of this honeycomb in, the, in a positive orthant and you chop it off with a, with a line here. That line can be x plus, I mean, x plus y equals some constant. But there's a, there's a similar variational principle. I won't write it down, but it looks the same way. But the surface tension is a little bit different. The, the entropy function is a little bit different. Uh, and, and then you, but, but somewhat surprisingly, again, the corresponding Euler-Lagrange equation can be solved. Uh, and this time it's in terms of Bessel functions. And we don't know why the, these reasonably simple functions happen. I mean, it's, it's, it's very unusual that you can write down just this Nonlinear elliptic PDE and actually find, be able to sort of integrate it. That's a that's a that's an indication that's that, that there's some sort of integrable structure underlying the model, but we don't have any way to. We don't really understand that. What? Oh yeah. So yeah, this graph is a is obtained. So you take the honeycomb. I, I sort of it's a skewed honeycomb, but it's really the. How do I draw it? <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the quadrant, it's the, it's the, it's the positive quadrant, and I, and I remove the line x plus y equals some constant, 100. In this case, 100 was 3 or something. And the constant does not enter in the, in the end. The, the, right, if I change the constant, then the, the rational numbers change, but the, there's, a, there's a rational solution for any constant. But uh, likewise, right, the, we can do the salt problem for any, any finite region, write down the uh, surface tension equation, the variational principle, and, solve, and in principle solve the orderly Lagrange equation uh, for that. Uh, yeah, and, and for, for this region, because we have an explicit solution in terms of binomial coefficients, we can take the asymptotics. That's what the, that's what the solution looks like for the height function. Uh, for what it's worth. It's a nice rational function. This is the only case where we get a sort of a rational function that we found, a rational solution to the, the, to the PDE. Okay, so now let's go up, go up a dimension to some 3D <coughs> lattices. And uh, uh, we tried pretty hard for the Z cube lattice, because that's the first thing you, you might try, and it just couldn't get it to work. Uh, but if we do this BCC lattice in Z3, so what is the BCC lattice? You take, uh, you know, if you look at the red dots here, they form a cubic lattice, and then the blue dots are at the at the body cent at the centers of the cube, the, the the dual lattice, Z cube plus a half, a half, a half, and then we can make now we can make this finite region, which we think of as a general as a sort of three dimensional version of the Aztec diamond. Maybe I should draw a picture here. The, you know, if you take the two-dimensional Aztec time and then you draw it on its, uh, on its side, right, then the, the black vertices form a n by n plus 1 grid, and the white vertices form a n plus 1 by n grid. And this is, in this orientation, it does look like a, the, the two-dimensional analog of the BCC lattice. So this is not, should not be too surprising that I mean, I'm, I'm surprising is the wrong word. Anyway, this is a natural thing to try to generalize the Aztec diamond to three dimensions. So here we have the reds, which form some A by B by C box. The blues form an A plus one plus by B minus one by C minus one box. And then you connect each red to the nearest, nearest neighbor blues. And in order to have a dimer cover, you need the number of reds to be equal to the number of blues. So you need this equation, but it's not a very strong constraint on A, B, and C. Uh, and it turns out that this, for this model, th there are some, uh, there is an exact, for, for mysterious reasons, which we don't understand, there's an exact critical gauge, which is just a rational, uh, which is rational. It's just by ratios, given by ratios of binomial coefficients. Here it is at the, at the red vertices and the blue vertices. Uh, 
And, and then you can just play the game and, and take the limit, the scaling limit, just like we did before, and you can find this three-dimensional scaling limit for the, well, what's the analog of the height function for a three-dimensional dimer, right? The, uh, in, in three dimensions, the, uh, there is no height function. The height is really a, uh, well, there's no height function, but, but what you can do is uh, take the vector field, right? So each, each, at each vertex, each black vertex, you, you can uh, direct the edges from, well, you direct all the edges from black to white. Each black vertex has degree eight. And then uh, uh, each edge has some probability and so you can make, so then you, you write the probability times the vector and you get a, vector, a random vector field. I mean, you get a non-random vector field for the, for the expected direction of the dimer. Did that make sense? <laughs> right? So for, all, for every black vertex, I got the vector B, B, W, B minus W. And I multiply that vector times the probability of BW occurring, and then I sum over all neighbors W, B. And that, that gives me some random vector field. So I, I'm thinking of that as a, that, that vector field is the, the expectation of that vector field is, is what is the analog of the derivative of the height function if you like, in two dimensions. And the, the, that vector field does have this uh, scaling limit, which is very simple. Uh, just depend, as a function of x, y, and z, the first coordinate only depends on x, second one only depends on y, and the third one depends on z. And here the alpha, beta, and gamma are just the s sizes of the box, the Aztec diamond scaling limit. Is the measure concentrated around this one? That's right. So the, the, the result is that the random dimer cover on this multinomial Aztec diamond concentrates in the scaling limit on this vector field. And there's, I tried to draw some integral curves of the vector field. I should have drawn a three-dimensional picture, but I just, there's a projection of it. These are just the integral curves of that vector field, and you can see they kind of come in perpendicular to the, the boundaries and then curve around and exit. Yes, and Jake. A equals one, do you recover the 2D aspect diamond? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good uh, that equation, I don't think, will be uh, satisfied because you have like a minus one or something. Right, because uh, uh, it's not quite the same graph. But yeah, it's a good question. I mean, let me think about it. <laughs> right? No, we don't. I mean, the, the correct, the, the the short answer is no, we don't. But maybe there's some simple relation which I'm not seeing. There might be some simple relation which, which really shows that we do get the same. Okay, uh, then, uh, well, the, the honeycomb worked in the plane. Let's think about what the analog of the 3D honeycomb model is. And this is just the diamond, diamond lattice, dimer model. How do you get the diamond lattice? You take the, you take Z cubed. Well, every vertex has degree four. How do you get the diamond? You take Z cubed and you split each ver vertex into two vertices, one white and one black. And the whites are connected to the negative coordinates and the blacks are connected to the positive X, Y, and Z coordinates. I can draw a picture. So here's your, here's your original vertex, which has degree six, and you split that up into one black and one white. And the blacks are connected in the, toward the positive coordinates and the, the whites are connected to the negative coordinates. So this is the Z cubed, and this is the diamond. Make sense? Anyway, and, and so we did the same, for some reason, we did the same thing as we took the model in an orthant and just chopped off the plane X plus Y plus Z equals constant. Well, so you imagine you have some sort of three-dimensional version of this, and then this is X plus Y plus Z equals you know, capital, capital M or something. And th then we were, we were able to, again, find a, find a nice 
critical gauge, right? The whole, whole game comes down to whether, given a graph, can we find a critical gauge, which is interesting. And here, again, the critical gauge was some ratio of binomial coefficients again. Uh, here are the Euler-Lagrange equations. Well, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, got, I got screwed up. <laughs> there, uh, just for the diamond lattice, one can look at the critical gauge equation, look at the Euler-Lagrange equation for the critical gauge, and write down the, write down the Euler-Lagrange equations. Now the, now the Euler-Lagrange equations for a vector field involve, there are really three equations uh, relating the partial derivatives. The vector field is UVW, and then there's these three equations which need to be satisfied for the three coordinates of the vector field. And, you know, trying to, f we don't know how to solve that equation in general. It's, it's much more complicated. The three-dimensional case is somehow more complicated than the two-dimensional case. Uh, but uh, given that particular solution we had on that particular region, we can at least find one limit shape, the scaling limit vector field on this uh, sort of truncated orthant, which when we rescale, we might as well set x plus y plus z bigger than one, has this very simple rational form, which you, I think you can check, if I didn't make a mistake, that this vector field does satisfy those equations. So again, it's a situation where uh, uh, we can write down this PDE in three dimensions, but you know, there's no sort of, because it's some nasty nonlinear PDE, we can't really hope of solving it, but for some mysterious reasons, there are some graphs for which you have an explicit solution, and that's an explicit solution. Okay. Uh, questions? Well, we know a lot more about the, in this model, there's, let's talk about the fluctuations. Um, for this multinomial dimer model, the fluctuations also are always given by Gaussians, uh, a Ga some Gaussian field. And uh, uh, which means because everything is Gaussian, we, we, it's, it's, it's much easier to get a handle on what the fluctuations are than in the general dimer case where it's very hard to prove things are Gaussian, although they are. Uh, in the in the in the planar case, people don't really understand the, the fluctuations in the higher dimensional cases. But uh, let me just sort of state, uh, well, state state the result for the two D Aztec diamond, uh, and uh, I, I could have stated a more general result, but I think it's 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 just a little bit sufficiently complicated that it's nice to focus on a given example. Uh, so here's the 2D Aztec diamond. It's, it's tilted. I, I rotated it so that it looks like a square, but it's really that, that graph there, the multinomial dimer model on this graph uh, in the scaling limit. Uh, and the, the fluctuations are given by some Gaussian free field, but unlike the uh, standard dimer model, it's an inhomogeneous Gaussian free field. Uh, what do I mean by inhomogeneous? It means that the underlying operator is not the standard Laplacian. You have to take the Laplacian with a varying conductance field. Uh, so imagine you, so he, let me just explain the picture and then I'll, I'll, I'll so, so I take the, our, our unit square here, or maybe this is the square zero pi comma zero pi. Uh, and on that, I have the standard conformal structure on the square, standard Euclidean conformal structure, but uh, I'm going to change the Laplacian by adding in this conductance term. So imagine that my plane is made out of copper, and then the sort of, maybe the thickness of the copper gets, gets thinner as you get near the boundary, according to this function kappa. That's what the meaning of this, of this, uh, mm, sort of non-homogeneous Laplacian. So what you do is, yeah, you take the, you take the gradient, then you multiply it by this function kappa, which depends on position. And that function kappa in this case is, uh, it's here, 
one over sine u sine v on this on this square zero pi squared. So the the conductance oh, I, I did it wrong. The conductance goes to infinity at the boundary, so it's very thin in the center, and it gets thick. Sort of the copper sheet gets thicker near the boundary. Uh, but you have the standard conformal structure. Then to, to get the actual fluctuations, you have to map that by some diffeomorphism phi, uh, which is just given by cosine u cosine v. And then you get the, the image is the correct field, the Gaussian field of fluctuations here. And uh, what I did is, what are these little circles? The little circles are supposed to represent the standard conformal structure. When you map them over, they become infinitesimal ellipses. Here in that ellipse field is telling you what the conformal structure is over here. Uh, and the grayscale is supposed to tell you the, the stiffness of the Gaussian free field. Okay, so now I can read the theorem. In the scaling limit, the height fluctuations are determined, are given by the image of a inhomogeneous Gaussian free field on the square, where the conductance function is kappa. Kappa is given by 1 over sine u sine b, and the diffeomorphism is given by some very simple trig, trig function. When you say height fluctuations, is there any rescaling? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, uh, the height functions are, fluctuations are of order, you know, square root of the, square root of n, n the blow up number. Yeah, I, I, sorry, I forgot to put that in. Right, the, the, the limit shape is, 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 is given by this, you know, x squared minus y, this harmonic function, x squared minus y squared, but the fluctuations are lower order. If you look at those fluctuations, they are described by some Gaussian field, this particular Gaussian field. Kind of has this kind of slightly non-trivial description, uh, but uh, I think what we learned from this example is that the boundary, you know, there's more than one Gaussian free field that comes up in these situations. We're, we're used to, in the standard Daimler model, having just the standard Gaussian free field, which for, for the usual Laplacian, but once we impose boundary conditions, uh, then you see that the, not only does the conformal structure bend, but change, but the, also the stiffness of the Gaussian free field change. The, the coefficient in front of the, you, know, you think of the Gaussian free field as defined by this, by this uh, quadratic form, but then you can also have a, this, this, and I don't know whether I should put kappa here or whenever kappa, I get confused. Kappa, let's pretend like it's kappa. Anyway, there's some function here which, which depends on the, the position, which, which determines the stiffness of the, of the Gaussian free field. Thank you. <laughs>